Good evening. <clears throat> the open meeting of this open meeting of the Arlington Finance Committee is being conducted remotely consistent with Governor Baker's executive order of March 12, 2020, due to the COVID-19 virus pandemic. In order to the transmission of the COVID-19 virus, we've been advised and directed to suspend public meetings. And as such, the governor's order suspends the requirements of the open meeting law to have all meetings in a publicly accessible physical location. Further, all members of the public, of public bodies are allowed and encouraged to participate remotely. The order which you can find posted with the agenda materials for this meeting allows public bodies to meet entirely remotely so long as reasonable public access is afforded so the public can follow along with the deliberations of the meeting. Ensuring public access does not ensure public participation unless such participation is required by law. This meeting will feature public comment only in writing by email to tbradley at town.arlington.ma.us. This meeting of the Arlington Finance Committee is convening by Zoom app as posted on the town's website, identifying how the public may join and comment. Please note the meeting is being recorded and that some attendees are participating by video conference. Accordingly, please be aware that other folks may be able to see you and take care not to screen share your computer. Anything that you broadcast may be captured by the recording. While supporting materials that have been provided to members of this body are available on the town's website unless otherwise noted. The public is encouraged to follow along using the posted agenda unless the chair knows otherwise. Let me, uh, permit me to cover some ground rules for an effective and clear conduct of our business and, and to ensure accurate meeting minutes. The chair will introduce each speaker on the agenda. After they conclude their remarks, the chair invites members to provide any comments, questions, or motions. Please hold until you are recognized and your name is called. Further, please remember to mute your phone or computer when you're not speaking, and please remember to speak clearly and in a way that helps generate accurate minutes. For any response, please wait until the chair yields the floor to you. If members wish to engage in colloquy with other members, please do so through the chair. Due to the size of my laptop, I may not be able to see all members at once. If someone has raised their hand and I have not noticed, I hereby request that Tara Bradley or Randy LaCourt please bring this to my attention. Permit me to confirm that all members are present and the Persons on the uh, agenda are, are also here. We'll check that right now. Please, um, please, uh, when I call your name, please state in the affirmative that you are, you are present. Grant Gibeon. Shane Blundell. Here. Uh, John Ellis. Micaiah Healy. Sorry, here. Here. Brian Beck. Here. Arif Padaria. Here. Sophie Maglas. Here. Here. Jonathan Wallach. Shane Crawford. Daryl Harmer. Here. Andy LaCourt. Here. Alan Jones. Here. George Koser. Here. Bill Keller. Here. Al Tassi. Here. Wanda Nascimento. Here. Christine Deschler is not here. Dean Carmen. Here. And David McKenna. Here. And Tara Bradley. Here. Thank you. Um, persons who uh, are expected to be here tonight include Sandy Pooler and Clarissa Rowe and some members of the Community Preservation Act Committee. Are any of those uh, individuals here at this moment? I see an Alexander Franzosa here. Hi, everybody. I'm with Clarissa tonight for the CPAC. Thank you, Alex Alexander. I think that um, Sandy and Ida or Ida will be here at 750. OK. So a uh, couple of comments here. Uh, tonight, we're going to have a presentation of the um, Community Preservation, Preservation Committee, whose acting chair is Clarissa Rowe. Uh, many of you know that she's been a town meeting member for many years and served on, I believe, uh, the, the select board, I believe, for five, ter uh, for five terms. Um, in addition, Clarissa was a prime mover, not only in getting the Community Preservation Act accepted in Arlington, but um, she was a prime mover at the state level 
getting this, the legislature and the government to accept the act in the first place. So I'm expecting from Clarissa and her colleagues, we'll be getting some extra special uh, expert information tonight. Uh, keep in mind that the Community Preservation Act Committee presents its proposal to town meeting directly, not via the Finance Committee. However, by the bylaw, they are supposed to coordinate with the Finance Committee and we generally review their proposals and if so inclined, we endorse it or not. So following the uh, presentation, um, any, and any discussion that we might have, um, a motion to endorse or not to endorse, or if a motion, if, if uh, someone thinks that we should endorse it, a motion would be in order at that time. Um, as you know, last meeting, we postponed the capital budget um, vote. We'll take that uh, up on Monday evening. The reason that it's not on tonight's agenda is that we have a working group looking into some issues and they haven't had time to pursue the questions that came up at the last meeting. And in addition, there was no time to put it on tonight's agenda while being in compliance with the open meeting law. We'll also hear from uh, Sandy Pooler and likely Ida Cody re or on the revolving fund issue raised by David McKenna and Sophie Magazzo. Um, so Daryl sent some emails out about the um, uh, police answer to questions about the police budget. And uh, I think that John Ellis also sent some uh, emails out with respect to questions from the DPW. Um, if we have, um, if anybody has any questions about those or would like to hear commentary, we can do that uh, after the presentation of the um, Community Preservation Act Committee and the budgets that we are going to be considering tonight. There's a section uh, on the agenda for old business and we can take it up there. Also, uh, Makaya Healy has uh, some changes that she wants to make in the um, personnel classification vote that we took several weeks ago. There have been some updates and uh, she would like to address that. So um, ha that having been said, I think that um, it's in order to consider minutes. Um, Tara, do you have minutes to post uh, to present on the uh, screen? Yes, and just a quick note is um, I forwarded um, the piece from John Ellis about the DPW. I haven't forwarded um, the responses from Chief um, Flatterty from Daryl, but I can do that um, in just a moment. But yes, I have um, meeting minutes from 228 and 32, and I can- Okay, okay so let's start with 228. So I have not received any um, requests for edits, although it has been less than 24 hours, um, but I have not received any requests for edits for this set of minutes. Is there a recommendation on the minutes for February 28th? Move they be accepted. Is there a second? Second. Okay. Um, <clears throat> Any further discussion on the minutes from 228? Um, all those in favor, Grant, Grant, Grant Gibeon? Shane Blundell? Yes. John Ellis? Yes. Kaya Healy? Yes. Brian Beck? Yes. Arif Padaria? Yes. I'm sorry, but Arif? I wasn't, I wasn't present. So. Abstain, okay. Um, Sophie? Yes. Jonathan Wallace? Shailene Crawford? Daryl Harmer? Yes. Annie LaCourt? Yes. Alan Jones? Yes. George Koser? Yes. Bill Keller? Yes. Al Yes. Juan de Nascimento? Yes. Christine's not here. Dean Carmen? Abstain. And David McKenna? Yes. Thank you. Uh, so there are two abstentions and one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, um, affirmative. There are three abstentions. Abstentions? Who did I miss? 
Healy Padaria Carmen. Oh, Makaya, you abstained. I didn't hear that. Can you confirm that? It is confirmed. Thank you. Okay, then the, the next minutes, uh, Tara, please. So the only comments I received from these, and again, sent out less than 24 hours ago, were from you, Charlie. Which I have here in red. So um, are there any uh, questions or comments on the minutes from um, 3-2? Motion, uh, motion is in order to um... move they be accepted. Second. second. Then moved and seconded. Uh, Shane Blundell. Yes. John Ellis. Yes. Kaya Healy. Yes. Brian Beck. Yes. Reef Padaria. Yes. Sophie Magliazzo. Yes. Jonathan Wallach's not here. Um, Shailene's not here. Daryl Harmer. Yes. Andy Lacourt. Uh, yes. Alan Jones. Yes. George Koser. Yes. Bill Keller. Yes. Alan Tassi. Yes. Juan De Nascimento. Yes. Christine's not here. Dean Carmen. Yes. And David McKenna. Yes. Um, unanimously accepted. Thank you. So uh, before we go on to the next uh, item, I just want to note, Dean, uh, you sent in um, some questions about the capital budget. Um, I know you were, weren't able to make the last meeting. Just want you to know that um, they were raised by uh, members of the committee and, and discussed by the capital planning committee. Thank you. I appreciate it. So um, we are early. Is Sandy here or Julie? No. Okay. Um, uh, can we start? Uh, can we do the inspections budget? Who is that? Uh, John, is that you or is that? Um, no, it's me, Daryl. Um, yes, let me just share the. Um, we, we probably can get through that pretty quickly, I think. Uh, Tara, can you let me share? Okay, try Thank again. You. Okay. Um, so the inspection budget um, is is pretty basic. Um, on the fifty one hundred line, the. Um, Reductions in salaries uh, from fiscal 22 to 23 uh, is accounted by the fact that um, a couple of senior um, staff had left, including the uh, Mike Byrne, the former uh, chief inspector. And so uh, the replacements are cheaper. Uh, so that really accounts for the difference there. Uh, any questions on salaries? And the same with longevity. But, um, any questions for Daryl on the personnel expenses and the, yes, Annie. Yeah, I'm just wondering, are, are they talking at all about adding any positions in the future? It seems like they're really stressed down there. Or the I'm gonna get to that, that um, in, a, in a minute, Annie. All right, I'll wait for then. Uh, you okay. have a question from Sophie. Yes, could you just explain line 5102? Quickly. Uh, they have um, historically had to bring in temps uh, to cover either cover vacancies or um, peak activities. And as you'll see further down, they've got pretty um, half their staff, half their positions are vacant. So as they're filling those, um, They've had to bring in temp help. Any other questions 
on the personnel uh, budget and uh, inspections. Go ahead, Daryl. Then on the expenses side, the only activity is uh, moving $1,000 uh, from the 5949 uh, vehicles account uh, to the office supplies account. Uh, they've freed up the money from vehicles uh, due to their use of electrical vehicles, which have, uh, which have been cheaper to, to uh, maintain and operate. And they've added the money into office supplies to account for uh, their increasing uh, production of information uh, packets and materials on uh, on various issues um, that they uh, they want to increasingly uh, produce to help um, navigate some of the inspections issues. Uh, I have on this next slide. I have some of the topics that they that they're publishing information on. Any questions on the expenses side? I have a question, um, Daryl. What are the contracted services for? Uh, sorry, I did not ask that. And you might, when you're looking into it, you might find out if they really, um, if they're spending that money in the current fiscal year, because there wasn't no no funds like that. there were no funds like that allocated in prior fiscal year. Right. Go ahead, please. Uh, okay, so there in the bottom here, there's the the topics they're producing information packets on erosion, the tree bylaw, good neighbor policy. Um, so then on the personnel side. Um, the lines that are highlighted in yellow, the positions that are highlighted in yellow are vacant. So as you can see, that's pretty much half their staff. Uh, they are making progress in filling those. They fill the, uh, they fill the plum plumbing and gas inspector position um, in between the time the budget was published and when I, when I talked to uh, Mike Ciampa. Uh, they're considering two applicants for the building inspector position and then the final one, the record keeper position uh, was posted and is closing. I guess it closed today. So as I said, they, uh, Mike Ciampa is, uh, is new to the position and he wants to get fully staffed up before uh, they assess, before he can fully accurately assess the department's capacity and needs going forward. Um, the, this past, past couple of years, like everybody else, they have been impacted by uh, COVID. Um, they've had to, um, one of their responsibilities has been to enforce job site masking and other COVID requirements. Um, staff, it's been a challenge for staff to work at home, but with all the inspection records back at the office. And then um, they've obviously had increased emphasis on job site safety concerns. So um, they're hopeful that they'll be fully staffed up uh, to their full budgeted complement, at least, um, very soon. And um, then they'll then he'll take stock of um, whether they whether he needs additional resources. Any questions on this? I don't think so. Go ahead. Okay, then on the permit revenue side, uh, over the five years from 2017 to 2021, uh, revenues have increased um, by about uh, just under $600,000. Um, I've got the, uh, the five years here, and then the, this uh, chart on the right. Um, uh, goes back to 2011 and also um, plots out the both the, the revenues and the number of permits issued. Um, so under the projections, their permit revenue increased by 23% from fiscal 2019 to fiscal 21, even though the number of permits, that, that permits issued actually decreased. Uh, and they're basically that's... Um, 
some of these large projects like the, the Myrac project, which generated 354,000 in permit revenues uh, have accounted for that. Um, they had expected, I think like everybody else, inspect, expected uh, significant reductions in construction during the COVID lockdowns. Um, but whatever, um, whatever slowdowns uh, there were, were more than offset by uh, dramatic increases in home renovations over the past couple of years. So the, uh, you can see the, uh, the permit revenues actually increased. Um, at this point, it's not clear if they'll be able to sustain revenues at the, at the 2021 level post COVID. Uh, they're really just gonna have to see. Um, it's a pretty volatile time right now. Any questions here? Looks like you're cleaning that one. Yeah. Okay, then on the issues, um, the I think everybody knows that their records are primarily paper-based. Um, and also, I'm pretty sure everybody knows they, um, they're they in temporary quarters. Um, and so a lot of their records are in crates and things. Um, um, Mike is pretty committed to uh, starting digitizing records as soon as they can. Uh, he understands that he needs to follow whatever standards are issued by IT for um, the uh, document storage and management systems. Again, he wants to fill his vacancies first, uh, and he expects that that new record keeper position will be heavily involved in the digi digitization. Uh, his current plan is to digitize these records incrementally using in-house staff. Um, I did have some questions about that. Uh, having um, been involved in projects like this in the past, they can be uh, pretty resource intensive. And I did get a look at some of the records. A lot of them are folded up with multiple, uh, multiple uh, pages, double-sided, uh, staples, paper clips, probably stickies and things. So. Uh, getting those um, all set to actually be scanned uh, can be pretty time consuming. So that may be something that um, needs um, some further thought about how, how they should go about doing that. I, I think a couple of years ago, um, when I talked to the uh, previous director, uh, he had told me that a director prior to him had mandated that all the records be um, organized by year, uh, which you can see if anybody wants to um, get the history of their property. Uh, for example, my house was built in 1929. So if I were to ask them for that, that would um, require them to look at um, probably about uh, was 89 or 90 uh, files to compile that. So obviously if their records were digitized, um, depending on how they uh, set up their indexes, um, they could get at their records in multiple ways. So um, I don't know if that's something that they, they would need to submit a capital request for, um, but uh, I do have questions about whether they really can um, uh, deal with it incrementally using in-house staff, uh, given that they don't have a whole lot of staff to begin with. Uh, then on the zoning violations issue, um, he was clear that uh, their prim priority is enforcing safety violations. Um, the enforcement process is very labor intensive with a lot of paperwork. They have to write up violators daily. Um, then they have to allow for appeals. Uh, and then the process apparently has to start over if they don't get a response from the violator. Um, they, are, they have been limited both by resource constraints and COVID, um, but he was also equally emphatic that uh, they, fully, they do fully intend to collect uh, all past due fines um, within the time periods uh, specified in the applicable bylaw. Um, then they plan, they, they, at this point, they look like they're gonna be able to move back to move to the new Grove Street building in about a year and a half. Uh, their new space is a little larger than the old building, and they apparently they have a more efficient uh, storage area. But, and then getting back to Annie's question uh, about the resource constraints, 
uh, whether they're adequate given the scope of responsibility and the volume and nature of their work. And the department is a revenue generator. Um, so when I've talked to, to both uh, Mike Byrne and then uh, Mike Ciampa, um, uh, they've been a little ambiguous about whether they really think they need to add resources or not. Um, it's probably a difficult question from a budget perspective, um, but I think that's something we do need to keep, keep an eye on. So any questions on any of these issues? Alan Jones. Uh, two quick things. One, just information. The $4,000 <clears> for contracted services has gone back at least to 2000. I looked at the old budgets, um, but it doesn't look like it's been spent. Uh, and, and the other thing that's there's probably no answer to it at this point, but there is an article in the draft warrant about increasing code enforcement and putting some code enforcement into the planning department. And I don't know how that would impact the uh, inspections department or whether it would, but I guess it's something to keep our eyes on. Well, we will we'll have a hearing on that. Uh, yeah. Um, so there may be a, a discussion about inspections department come up with that. Thank you. Thank you, Alan. Any other questions for Daryl? Daryl, would you like to make a motion on this? Uh, yes, I move that um, the inspection budget uh, as printed for fiscal 23, $499,072 be approved. Second. So it's been moved and seconded for um, $499,072. Is that correct? Is that the right number? Looks like yes. it. Yeah. Okay, Grant Gibbian, not here. Shane Blundell? Yes. John Ellis? Yes. Micaiah Healy? Yes. Brian Beck? Yes. Marie Fedaria? Yes. Sophie Megliazzo? Yes. Uh, Shailene Crawford, she's not here. Daryl Harmer? Yes. Yanni LaCourt? Yes. Alan Jones? Yes. George Koser? Yes. Uh, Bill Keller? Yes. Al Tassi? Yes. Wanda Nascimento? Yes. Dean Corman? Yes. And David McKenna? Yes. So the, the uh, budget is passed uh, unanimously. Thank you very much, Daryl. So I see Sandy Pooler here. Sandy, are you alone or do you have someone with your- here as well. Ida here? Um, oh, Ida, okay, thank you. So uh, this is, the subject is the, um, I believe it's the Warren article on the, um, the issue of revolving funds for private, private, um, private ways. So, uh, you, uh, David and uh, Sophie brought this up. Uh, there were some questions. And um, if you would like to speak on it, um, Sandy, our deputy, our deputy town manager and finance director, please uh, go right ahead. Thank you. Uh, uh, Ida and I will be happy to uh, answer questions. I will just give a brief rundown. Um, this, uh, just to be clear, um, this is a uh, request to the Finance Committee to increase the spending cap for the revolving fund for private way, way repairs. Um, it's just, by the way, it's not a warrant article, it's just a mid-year request, which is allowed by state law. Um, there are two reasons uh, that we're asking for this. One is that um, because we had a very large project on Mount Gilboa Street uh, that was $221,000 this, this year, uh, it exceeded the $200,000 limit that town meeting last uh, spring had voted for spending here. So what we're asking is that the Finance Committee follow the lead of the select board in their vote on Monday night to increase the limit from 200 to 275,000. Um, so it's just a cash flow issue, it's a technical issue. 
which leads to the second reason we're asking for this is that we need to pay the contractor who did the work and we are not allowed to make those payments legally until uh, we have an increase in this authorization level. Um, as the memo explains, this revolving fund is there uh, so that when the town makes repairs to private ways, which is different from converting a, or accepting a private way as a public street, it's just simply repairing a private way. If a majority of residents on that street uh, petition the select board for permission to do this uh, and pay one third of the uh, construction cost up front. Uh, they can then hire a contractor from a list approved by the engineering department. The work gets done, then a final bill gets sent out. Um, many of the residents uh, pay the full amount right away. Some small percentage of them uh, typically will put this on as a betterment assessment and get to pay it off over five years. Uh, we do have the, the cash coming in from residents. Uh, to pay the contractor uh, and just need this authorization in order to be able to write the check to the contractor. Um, I will also say, just to anticipate a question that may come up, we are looking at, at town meeting for the article on um, revolving funds generally and are trying to figure out what the best number would be for FY23 for a spending limit given we know that we have at least one more $150,000 project that's coming. Uh, uh, frankly, typically these projects are usually in the $25,000 or $30,000 range. So um, I think as people be have become more aware of their ability to repair their private ways, they become more active in petitioning the select board. With that, I and Ida would be happy to answer any questions that you have. Thank you, Sandy. Thank you, Ida. Alan Jones, is your hand up? No, it's not. Shane Blundell. Yeah, yes, thank you, Charlie, and thank you, Sandy. Um, can, um, can I just make sure I understand this? So the residents pay one third up front. Um, I guess sort of how does the money flow? Does the town pay? And then I guess, what? And like, so how does it, does the, the town sort of pay the money first, then the citizens or the abutters, I guess? pay the town back either in a lump sum or and then the second part of the question is sorry i'll just get it both out there and is is the 200 that is the increase to reflect the entire cost or just the one third of the two thirds cost i guess yeah so uh, oh yeah i'll leave the floor to that thank you sandy so just like when we pay for a contract we pay uh the contractor gets paid once the work is finished um so the bylaw requires that residents put up at least a third up front so that um, we have, we, we know that they're really serious about doing this. Um, and then they have the option again, either to pay it off over five years as a, a lien on their tax bill or a betterment assessment, or they can just pay it up front uh, when we send out a bill, which as they say, typically is, is what happens. Um, the second part of your question was, what does this increase do? It will cover the cost incurred for, both for uh, Mount Gilboa Street and a few other smaller projects that were undertaken in FY22 so that we can pay all of those projects. And Ida, correctly, correct me if I'm wrong, please, but um, I don't believe that we pay the contractor until we have, we can't really pay the contractors until we have sufficient funds from residents in the revolving fund. Uh, there, there is a balance that carries over in this revolving fund from year to year. Um, so that if there's enough money in that balance, we are able to write a check. Uh, but for something like this big Mount Gilboa one, we really need uh, enough residents to pay up. Um, if I could just add one more thing, I know you didn't ask about it, but uh, if residents uh, elect to put this on their tax bills as a betterment, we don't have that money going into this revolving fund. By law, it goes to the general fund as, uh, as, as revenue. It, it comes in under code for, for, for betterments or special assessments. 
from time to time, we have had to pre-fund this revolving fund with general fund funds. We did that last in 2016, where we had town meeting vote $100,000 to go into the fund. So there'd be for a cash flow uh, perspective. Uh, we may need to do that again, uh, given some of the big projects that are coming up, but Ida and I are working on that now, and you'll hear from us on that uh, for the Warren articles. Um, Thanks. That, that is accurate, Sandy. We never, we're not allowed to deficit spend. We never spend more than we have in the fund. But because there is a timing um, issue here, well, it's not an issue, it's a good thing because people have to pay up front a third. For example, we have um, currently we have a project for which the residents paid or Tona, but we haven't done the work yet. So there is always a cash flow. However, we always reconcile these accounts and we keep an eye on them and make sure that we, if we know that a certain project, if a certain project is large enough that people will not be able to pay the whole amount and we know that it will be added to their taxes then we have to evaluate and we have to eventually come up with the money, with the seed money to fund the project. Um, and this particular case, in the past, um, most of the projects were already paid. So people chose to pay the full amount. We actually had some people overpay because they paid the estimate and the, the cost came in under, um, came less than the estimate. So for the most part, in the past, people paid for the project. Uh, there, there's now a, a large project, Gilboa, that will go to the taxes, at, for which we are looking into it and possibly we might need some money to fund it. Thank you, Ida. Thank you, Sandy. Sophie? Yes, thank you. Um, so, Sophie, pro, Sophie. We lost you, Sophie. I have to. Um, you lost. We we didn't hear me? what you said. We lost you. you oh, lost you. oh, sorry. This um this came up with the select board budget briefly just because they have to publish legal um legal notices about about private way um these private way projects and they're anticipating that these projects go up in the next. Uh, they've been going up and they expect it to go up for another year or two and then they think they'll level out and i think they told us that um these we we lost you again years do you know how long these betterments are for uh, the betterments by bylaw can be uh on people's tax bills for five years I mean, how long will the public street be good? I mean, how often does a private way have to redo their private way? That somewhat depends on the tolerance of private way residents for potholes. So when you pave a street like this, it should probably last 20 years. But um, then it's up to the residents whether they want to just patch it or actually go through this process again. Um, I think it has been less frequent that people have been taking advantage of this uh, revolving fund, but as the town has made an effort to uh, publicize it more, I think we see more uh, residents coming forward and asking for this fund to be used to repair their roads. And, and it's really up to them uh, with the approval of the select board to go ahead and do that. And is there, um... Is there a site somewhere on the website where people can see which roads, which private ways have been done using this um, project or which ones are in the pipeline so that if they notice a street, they can see if it's already in the pipeline? I do not know the answer to that question. Okay. Thank you. Probably should check with DPW, Sophie. Okay. I, I, don't, I don't know if it's on the website, but... Um, the Light Board's office has a list of all the projects approved, and then they communicate with us and we coordinate all the work and the payments. Right. I just think it'd be it'd be nice to know, I don't know, show off the work on public information. <laughs> Any other questions for Sandy or Ida on this subject? So I, I have a question. Um, and Ida obliquely referred to this when she was speaking before. So we're being asked to raise the um, limit 
on the revolving fund for fiscal year 22 and, and um, future years will be considered at town meeting. But if we have to raise this limit, have you collected enough money to handle the vendor demand uh, in fiscal year 22, or are you going to have to come back, I guess, to the finance committee for a reserve fund transfer? Or how, how do you plan to fund the increased limit? Let me put it that way. Yeah. So the um, the fiscal year 22 is done. We're actually going to have a surplus of $1,900 in the in the um, in the fund. No more bills will be paid out of this fund this fiscal year. We had two projects this year. We had Elmhurst and Gilboa, and they're both done. So fiscal year 22 is done. We just needed authority, the authority to um, spend this money because we did have the money, but we couldn't spend it because of the cap of 200. Okay, thank you for that. I understand. Yep. So if, if, the, uh, if this fund doesn't have, a, if the, the fund for the fiscal 22 projects uh, don't have enough money in fiscal 23, in any event, that'll be covered by whatever you propose at town meeting. Correct. We propose the seed money to cover whatever um, projects are not that we don't know of. So, and, so one more question. Um, so we we let me make the assumption you have a two hundred thousand dollar problem right now, or let's say a hundred thousand dollar problem right now, and then. You've got a couple of big projects coming up next year. Let's say that that's worth uh, two or three hundred thousand dollars. So probably we're talking about three hundred thousand dollars in the aggregate. Um, if we have to increase the, let me use the term float or the the um, the, the working capital in this fund. Um, yeah, the cap. Yeah. Is that a is that an expense or is that an asset? In other words, does it affect our um, balancing the budget? No, it doesn't affect anything because people will be paying. It just gives us the ability to pay it because normally the reason why we have this, this cap is although you have, let's say you're collecting $400,000, but because the town meeting voted only $200,000, you cannot, you cannot spend more than that. So but it's my not- question, Ida, my question is, I understand that the people will be paying. My question is, the rate at which they're paying. However, let's assume that 99% of them decide to go on the five-year payment plan. Then you don't have the money in the fund. So if we have to vote to put additional money in the fund so you can pay the vendors, does that, is that an expense or is that an asset? That would be an expense and that would be a problem, but uh, hopefully we'll not have 99 people defer it because the law says that they have to pay a third. So the problem is that we would have to come up with the other two thirds. We could be able to manage because let's say the cash flow, let's say some people already paid in full. We, we did actually have some people who overpaid. So it's it's just juggling the, the cash flow. But okay. so we I think get I would like to, I'd like to ask that you, um, you uh, Sandy and you and the team there, carefully consider this going into town meeting because it's going to, it could affect how the budget gets balanced. Yeah, we, we already thought about it. So we have, uh, we know of two projects and we anticipated that we're gonna, people are gonna pay a third and let's say we would have to come with two thirds, but we also discussed whether we should go for more just in case there will be another project that we're not aware of and people will not be able to pay um, like they used to in the past. So and Charlie, we'll, be... we'll, we'll take a look at the, we, we're looking at a couple of different ways possibly to fund this. We haven't made a final decision on that. Uh, and we will be back to you about our recommendation. Thank you. Okay. Wanda, question. Now, I guess I had a similar question because you said that when people elect to have it, what is it, a tax assessment, that you never get that money. If that the goes. The revolving fund does not get the money the general fund does. It comes in just as if people were paying their taxes or people were paying a fee for buying a map or something like that. It's just general fund revenue. Mm -hmm. uh, it's spread out over five years and people are charged 
by bylaw a 5% int interest rate on whatever they don't pay, uh, you know, what's unpaid from year to year. So the general fund, the taxpayers get made up, get made whole, um, but that money going into the general fund cannot be used to pay the contractors. Only the money in the revolving fund can be used to pay uh, the contractors. So just to, in sum, the end of the day, the taxpayers are held harmless by that, this activity, but how and when the residents decide to pay their bills, whether it's writing us a check or putting it on our taxes, determines where the money goes and the cash flow issues that we have to deal with. I, I hope that's clear. Thank you. Yeah, but I just said it was an, ex an expense somewhere. And then the offsetting revenue goes into the general fund. So it just it seems well, strange. Let's wait until, let's wait until uh, we, we deal with the Warren article. I mean, I think oh. we focus on the issue that we want an answer to and we'll find that answer when um, when the town manager or the deputy town manager and Ida come back uh, with the Warren article. Okay, so uh, I think any further questions? Yes, Micaiah. Um, so Sandy, you said that if, if this, if we keep the cap the way it is, the, the limit the way it is, you're still trying to figure out how to pay the vendors. So is that correct? If you vote no, we cannot pay the vendor. So we need to vote yes, so the vendor can get paid for the work it has already done. That will be paid for by money from the residents of the street. They've given us the money. We just can't write a check unless you vote yes to raise the limit. Thank you, Sandy. Any other questions on this subject? Sophie, I think it's uh, perhaps in order to make a motion uh, to raise the limit to uh, 207 from, from $200,000 to $275,000 for the private way repair revolving fund. Yes. Did you just make that motion? Yes, I just made that motion. I got second. 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 So it's been moved and seconded to raise the uh, private, private way revolve, repair revolving fund limit from $200,000 to $275,000 for fiscal 2022. Any further discussion? Okay, we'll take a vote. Jane Blundell? Yes. Um, John Ellis? Yes. Makaya Healy? Yes. Brian Beck? Yes. Arif Padaria? Yes. Sophie Magliazzo? Yes. Uh, Jaylene uh, Crawford. I'm here. Um, Daryl Harmer. Yes. Andy LaCourt. Yes. Alan Jones. Yes. George Koser. Yes. Bill Keller. Yes. Al Tassi. Yes. Juan de Nascimento. Yes. Dean Carmen. Yes. And David McKenna. Yes. Thank you. Uh, the vote is in favor of increasing the fund uh, for fiscal year 22. It is unanimous. Thank you all very much. Thank you, Sandy. Thank you, Ida. We appreciate Thank your you, time. Sandy. Thank you. Good night. Good night. Good night. Okay. So the next item on the agenda is the um, presentation from the Community Preservation Act Committee, and we're 18 minutes behind schedule here. Sorry, everyone, but we appreciate your patience. And um, we have with us tonight, let me see, can um, we have, we ha I, I think we have Larissa Rowe and uh, Alexander, um, did I write your name down? No, I didn't. Alexander, I can't see your, let's see here. Renosa. Renzosa. Renzosa, Alexander <laughs> Renzosa. Thank you. Is there anyone else um, from the committee here? No. No. Okay. Well, then, uh, uh, Clarissa, um, 
I did report to the committee uh, earlier that you were responsible, in addition to being a select person, was it five terms that you were a select on the select board? I was elected for two and I was appointed twice. Okay, so, well. But I no more. I don't, no know what we, I don't know what we call that, but, but in any event, extensive service as a member of the select board. And um, also the one of the prime movers in getting the Community Preservation Act um, established in the first place at the State House. So, um, and plus your many years of service in town meeting. Um, so let me turn it over to you and to um, Mr. Franzosa. Alexander. Alexander. Yes. And, um, um, Alexander did this slideshow for me. I which I'm very you. appreciative of because I am good at um, PowerPoint, but I'm old and he's faster than I am because I believe he's younger. Anyway, it's nice to see you all. Um, <clears throat> I just want to say a couple of things before Tara starts the slideshow. This has been a ba banner year for the Community Preservation Act in Arlington. Um, the state fund um, not only reimbursed us once, but will reimburse us again. And we had more money this year than we've ever had. And as a result, we've been able to fund almost every project that came in front of us. And you will see them, I'm gonna go through them, and then we can um, sort of stop on the spreadsheet and then I can take questions. If you have, questions about the projects, I, it probably would be good for you to write them down and then I'll answer them all at one time, if that's okay. I think that's the right thing to do, thank you. Okay, okay, Tara, take it away. This is our um, fiscal 2023 budget. Um, before we go to the next slide, I wanna tell you, besides Alexander, the people on the Community Preservation Act Committee are Joanne Robinson, Joanne Preston, Dave Swanson, Leslie Mayer, Ken Lau, Sue Doctorow, and Pam Heidel. Um, they come from a variety of backgrounds, which is very helpful. Okay, next. The Community Preservation Act for you new people on Finance Committee is an act that um, funds historic preservation, open space, and recreation and community housing. Next. By law, each of the um, spending areas, housing and open space and recreation and historic preservation, each need to have 10% of the yearly money um, allocated to them. We always spend more than the 10% and you can spend up to 5% of your money on CPA expenses. That money is spent um, partially on the salaries of Julie Wayman and Jim Feeney and a minute taker. Um, and they are worth their weight in gold. Next. <clears throat> this is the beginning of the projects. I'm gonna start with the community housing. Um, this is going to be a long-term project. Some ARPA funds are being um, spent on it as well. It's replacing the windows in Mononymy Manor, and you'll see um, the conditions of the windows and the caulking. And unfortunately, the residents of Mononymy Manor pay their own heat. So this is a really important project, and um, we believe that we should be funding it. And next. The next one is, although it's the Somerville Homeless Coalition, their leasing deferential program is for apartments in Arlington. And um, they, um, as the rents go up, they make up the difference. Um, and it's a very good program. The Somerville Homeless Coalition has worked well for the town. They have helped um, deal with the homeless situation in the Mugar Woods, and they are a great organization. Next. Um, and we are, funding the Arlington Affordable Housing Trust Fund, which is in its first year. Um, they came to us last year and we wouldn't fund them because they, hadn't, they hadn't, weren't underway, but this year they have a board of trustees, which is full of very competent people. 
and we felt that we really should um, put some money in their pot. We, as you know, don't have a lot of money, but we do, we think that their work will be very valuable to the town. Next. And this is herd field. Um, this is the second phase of the work. And you can go through the next couple of slides, Tara, um, to see these are the same slides you saw last year. <laughs> it's in very bad shape. And in fact, um, you can go to the next one. Um, they, the Conservation Commission has been working with them and they may have a third phase next year to deal with some of the issues with the um, mill brook that goes underneath the, the, um, the field. Ne next. These are obviously the open space and recreation um, projects. This is Robin's Farm Playground. And as most of you know, I'm sure, and Alan Jones, of course, knows, um, this is a regional resource. People come from all over um, surrounding towns to play on this playground. And it's out of code and it really needs help. Um, and it's a, it's a wonderful asset for the town. Next. And we have the Mount Gilboa feasibility study. What the Conservation Commission and the Planning Department are gonna do is really look at what kind of use should be occurring in that house. It's an historic house. It has been rented to Pam Hallett in the last um, little while and was had one of our um, head planners there for many years. And it really should be, it should have a town use, but um, I think it's a very good idea. Um, it's not to look at the land, it's really to look at the house. So um, next. And another wonderful resource in town, the Cook's Hollow Restoration Feasibility Study um, was brought to us by two individuals and we told them that they couldn't be funded and they had to find um, a partner. So now um, the planning department and David Morgan were, will be overseeing the work. And um, we've over the years had a lot of ideas for this area. You can see on the left-hand picture, the, the water is not high, but it, at times the Millbrook gets up so high that the water goes up to the bridge. So. It really is, it's a complicated project. It needs to be thought about. And I think this is just one phase. Next. And this is one of the reasons that we passed the, the, the Community Preservation Act in Arlington because of the Jarvis House preservation and restoration work. This town asset that we have our legal department in, it has been falling down for years and um, they're gonna get a good start on it with this. Um, they're gonna do some painting and some replacement of um, rotten wood. We actually raised their request um, because working with Kin Lau, who's an architect, we felt that they needed to um, have more money in their request. We don't usually do that, but um, we did in this case. Next. Um, and this is, this is one of two projects that I, when I was listening to the inspectional services um, report from um, Daryl, I realized that this is this one and the next one, the Dallin Museum Collection Preservation is a wonderful project. And one, as you can see, the price tag is pretty low, but they've had, they've been storing their collections in the following conditions. This is not unlike, next one. <clears throat> next, oh, it's not at the next one. I'm sorry, it's down in preservation, but there is also a planning department um, conservation and preservation project for their documents. And we're hoping to use that as a model for the rest of the town, where the, whether it's inspectional services. Um, thank you, Tara. Um, and or you know the clerk's office, the select board's office. This is something that needs to be done with all our old files. 
And the best thing about it is both places, the Allen Museum and the planning department are hi hiring outside experts to come in and deal with it and are not, they will use their staff to some extent, but it's not as staff intensive as the inspectional services people were thinking. So um, I think we missed one, Tara, can you go back? Yes, the Covenant Church is in the Heights at the foot of the Mount Gilboa Historic District. And it's right across the street from the new Housing Corporation of Arlington buildings. It's, um, it's as you can see, it has um, accessibility issues getting to the front door. And also um, a couple of restrooms on the first floor are not handicapped accessible. We went back and forth about this because there has been a lawsuit about churches using CPA money, but that is mostly because of the religious um, elements of the church. This is not religious elements, this is um, ADA accessibility. So we felt we could go forward with it. And the church has, one of the requirements we have in our committee is if we're doing something like this, the entity has to be um, one that works with the community and this church does. In fact, they do an awful lot of outreach programs to the surrounding neighborhood and to the senior buildings. So we were very impressed with it. Next. And these are two of our old favorites, um, the Old Schwab Mill um, doing the north and west sides. We've done some of the other work and we've done some of their outbuildings. And then the preservation of the Jason Russell House which is probably our most important historic resource. They are, they are also doing some other work on the other side of the, um, the house. Um, and these are wonderful resources. Next. One of the things that happened after we got our 15 or our 13 projects is that there was a fire at Chestnut Manor and the head of the um, Arlington Housing Authority wrote to see if there was any way we had any mo extra money to do some electrical repair, up electrical panel upgrade. They found after the fire that the cause of the fire was these electrical panels. And um, the electric system in these buildings does everything. It does the heat, it does your cooking, it does the elevators. So we, um, we know there is some DHCD money coming through the state. They've set it aside, but they haven't yet um, come up with a way for communities to apply for it. And because of the death at, at Chestnut Manor, we felt that this was something that we needed to fund right away. So this is going to do um, I think about 300 panels in the Hauser building. So I think that's it. Let's see, we, is the next one the spreadsheet? Yes. Um, one of the things that I noticed in the spreadsheet <laughs> about half an hour ago was one of our total, one of our cells is wrong. Um, and basically, the big, the yellow that's highlighted, you can see we have $3.6 million this year. The 79,000, which is the second state match we're gonna get, we aren't actually gonna get in this, in, until the next fiscal year. So we're not spending that, but we're spending 3.44905, 904 in um, this year. That's what our, totals come to. Um, the historic preservation subtotal is not 17,000, it's 517,601. So we just, we left out a five. And I apologize for that. But um, that is what we're doing. And maybe this is a time we could, um, I can take some questions. And then we have another slide at the end, which is our five-year plan, which I can talk about after this. 
but I'd love to take any questions anybody has. Alan Jones has a question, Charlie. Yeah, I'm sorry, it was on mute. Alan Jones, your hand yeah. is up. Hi, Hi Clarissa. Um, uh, you mentioned ARPA funding, some some ARPA funding, and I don't see it in the spreadsheet. Um, no, it's funding. not. I'm not in charge of ARPA funding. I'd like to be. Oh, so that you're so like code. <laughs> yeah. So C, the CPA fund isn't getting any ARPA funding directly. No, just, I okay. wish it was. I okay. have a lot of ideas. <laughs> that clarifies it. Thank you. No. Thank you, Dallin. Got to get reappointed for that. Clerk. No, thank you, Annie. It's your turn now. Any, uh, questions for um, John Ellis. Um, I think at last year's presentation, or maybe it was the presentation the year before, there was some concern about the state fund that's used for matching running out of money, and didn't seem to happen this year. You mentioned that you got, you know, a lot. What, what, what's can you give me an update on? Uh, yeah, what, what um, that is? absolutely. <laughs> Um, the fund, the state fund is funded by real estate transfers. Um, you, uh, there's a certain percentage of your deeds fee that goes into this, um, this state fund. And you, although we've been in COVID and a pandemic, the housing sales have just gone through the roof. So when there's very strong sales of housing, the fund goes up. If there were a decline, which there doesn't seem to be in Boston, then the fund would go down. Does that make sense, John? Well, as I, I, I thought there was sort of more to it that more towns are passing CPAs and that, that you know. That had been a worry. Um, we, at the beginning, I think the smaller towns that accepted at first were very anxious that the cities not come in and eat up all the funds. And that, you know, the city of Boston was gonna come in and take all their money. Yeah. Well, it hasn't happened. So, okay. you know, the, um, the cities, I mean, it was, the legislation um, was meant for all 100, 300 and, and uh, whatever number, 46, 40, 50 um, municipalities. So it's, you know, it's that was a worry at the beginning. It's not a worry anymore. Okay. Fantastic. I have a problem, maybe a big problem with the Covenant Church. All the other places that you're giving the money are either public entities or private nonprofits sort of open to everybody serving a public need. But to give one particular or one church for accessibility and bathrooms, I mean, there isn't a church in this town that doesn't have accessibility issues. And if you, 100,000 there, I, 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 I mean, this is your decision. I'd much rather, you know, get the monotony man or window replacement going faster. I, I don't think that, uh, I, I don't think the Covenant Church is is reasonable or or appropriate? Uh, every other church has to pay for their own mm -hmm. accessibility and bathrooms. You know, uh, we, we've got a lot of other public needs um, that could that could use the money, as opposed to opening this Pandora's box of every church in the town coming in, looking to have you redo their bathrooms. Um, Alan, I understand that. This is the first church that's applied, number one. And number two, we probably got 12 letters of support from the community members that they, they do outreach to, which I will forward to you so that you understand. It is, a, it is a private entity. They're putting in a third of the money. We're doing two thirds. Um, one of the requirements that we have in our application is that if you know it's if it's a nonprofit, it's not going to be um, a and that's not going to be allowed if it's not you know there's a there's a school as part of the church there 
they really do an awful lot of outreach. They have done a lot of work with the Housing Corporation of Arlington. Um, I, I, I agree with what you're saying, but this is an application that came to us and we felt that we could do it. Um, but I will, Al, I'll send you the application so you can see the letters that we got. A, a lot of churches in this town, High Rock Church in Arlington Center is the most handicapped, inhospitable church in the entire town. And they do a ton of work for the town. Uh, mm -hmm. From tutoring kids in the high school to supporting AYCC uh, social worker. Uh, I, I won't beat on it, but I just think it's inappropriate. Okay, no, you're, you're I mean, I, I, we discussed it ad nauseum. We got Doug Hyam to weigh in. We got the um, Community Preservation Coalition to weigh in. So we felt we made the right decision. Annie? Uh, Annie LaCourt. So just to follow up on what Al was asking, if I understand correctly, you didn't have anybody you turned down this year, correct? No, no, we, we, we had a couple of um, applications that didn't come to the final round that okay. we asked them. We have two application rounds, a preliminary. Mm -hmm. And at times we ask a lot of pointed questions to people. Mm -hmm. And that's one of the things we did with the Covenant Church, for instance, is yeah. to say exactly what Al Tosti said and yeah. said, you have to prove to us that you really are a community-based organization. And that's when they got all those letters. All so there, there were some other, a couple of other things that didn't come to fruition. I don't need to go into who they were though. Okay. Um, so, I mean, I guess where I'm going is, you know, the, the, although I think Al's concern is well taken, I also think it's a question of prioritizing what's in front of you when you get applications. Yeah. So uh, given the scale of what you were able to do this year, it doesn't seem like a huge chunk of money to me. Um, and it seems to me like you asked the right questions, which is, okay, is this really just to benefit your members or is this gonna benefit your local community because of your activities? Um, mm -hmm. Iraq came to you and asked you for money, they would certainly qualify on the same basis. Exactly. They certainly would. They would. Exactly. Okay. Sophie. Sophie, I can't hear you. Yeah, thank you. Um, did you turn down any applications then um, that could have gotten the funds instead of the church? No. I mean, that's a complicated story. There was, there were a couple of, there was a, at least one preliminary application that we asked a lot of questions of and they didn't come to the final application round. We didn't turn them down. We just said, these are the requirements for you to come to the final application. And I'm not gonna go into who that was. Okay, that's fine, thank you. One more question um, on the open space and recreation for the feasibility studies for the not Gaboa. Um, what? Who? Who gets hired to do those studies? And and is there what kind it's of basic? Um, well, for instance, the Mount Gilboa feasibility study, they will probably hire um, a preservation architect and an engineer because of the um, there's structural problems in both, mostly in the garage that's up there, but also in the building. Um, and with Cook's Hollow, this is, it, although it has a name, it's really a feasibility study. And it will be mostly public outreach for people, people's ideas for what happens at um, Cook's Hollow. And at the moment, it's just the planning department. Thank you. So Clarissa, um, <clears throat> I have a concern with your answer to Sophie about not naming the projects that were not uh, passed. Uh, my understanding is that the Community Preservation Committee operates under the open meeting law and all these, all these applications have minutes and um, yeah. um, breakfasts. Oh, you know, all right, Charlie. It was the, the, the Housing Corporation of Arlington came forward with a project and they 
we asked them for some financial information that we couldn't get. And we asked them for um, a understanding of what had gone wrong. They, they wanted to capture some overrides of the previous projects. And it was a lot, it was sort of backtracking on their projects. They had, a, it was a very complicated, very um, difficult. Um, okay. It's I mean, I, I, we don't have to, I just want to no, you know, record as to what, which ones were. Um, right. Were there any, were there any and, other? I don't think there were. I, you know, I'm old, Charlie. I can't remember everything. It was a long time ago. I can double check and get back to you. Okay, that would be fine. Thank you. Any other questions for uh, Clarissa Rowe? Oh, Al Tassi, is your, no, that's not your hand. Um, Charlie, um, yes. would it be appropriate for me to ask a question as secretary in this case? I just, I have a question sure. like as a resident, I guess. Um, my question, Clarissa, is oh, yeah. whether... I don't think so, Tara. So. Oh, I... okay. Sorry. Sorry. Okay. You can you can email me, Tara. John Ellis. I'll ask the question. Um, are there uh, diversity and inclusion standards for the um, for uh, the people applying? So specifically related, I think, to the Covenant Church, but are there? Diversity and inclusion expectations. Um, there haven't been in the past. John, we'll look at it. I think that's a good suggestion. One of the things I haven't shown you yet is the last slide, which is our five-year plan. I don't know if you, we could look at it quickly. Um, the, I believe the finance committee has asked for this and we have asked our usual applicants for um, ideas of how much they would spend Mostly it's the um, park and rec recreation and the preservation people. You know, the, how, the biggest missing element in this estimated balance is um, the Housing Corporation of Arlington didn't have a new project this year. And the, um, we don't get on an annual basis anything from the Arlington Housing Authority. So, the money, the biggest money we spend is on community housing. And um, so we did spend a lot of money on Monotomy Manor. We will next year as well. But that is, it, it makes us look like we have a lot of money. We don't. I mean, we are usually, this is a really unusual year that we had enough money to fund everybody. Uh, Arif? Yeah, I, uh, I have a question about the last statement that you made, which is monotony housing. Um, you spent a lot of money on it and you expect to spend again. Can you explain that? And uh, how, yeah, how do you know a, already why you're going to be spending? And, and so, well, yeah. very, thank you, Arif. Um, very often, large projects come in with a multi year budget and <laughs> The Monotomy Manor total budget, I think, is $6 million. We're a small funder, um, so they don't usually ask us for that. They are going to get some ARPA money through the town to do the windows. They're going to do it in a three-year project. So they are going to ask us next year for another 500000 But that's, that's why, you know, that's unusual for them. Usually they come in one a one year um, increment. Okay, thank you. You're welcome, Daryl. Uh, yes, yeah, picking up on uh, Al's concerns about the uh, uh, funding the Covenant Church project, I have the same unease. But um, and, and I thought, Clarissa, I thought you said that uh, they were the first church that had applied for. Uh, community preservation funds. So my question is, are you ensuring that uh, whatever animal processes um, and questions you asked of them, uh, you've documented so that if you do get uh, applications in the future from similar institutions, that, uh, you can be sure that 
um, you can never be accused of treating them any differently than uh, Covenant was? Yes, absolutely. I completely Thanks. agree with you, Daryl. I mean, I don't, I'm sort of hoping I mean, we have some beautiful churches in this town. We have one in East Arlington that's got a, um, a tower designed by Bullfinch. If that was falling apart, I would love them to come to the Community Preservation Coalition and ask for money. I mean, I, I just think it's a, it just was one incident. And I can, I think what I should do is send all of you the application, the full application, so you can look at what we ask. And if you think can think of other um, things that we should add in the future, we would be delighted to do that. Okay, thank you. We basically, we basically we get funding from, you know, we we decide on these things by who who applies. Jane Blundell. Thanks, Charlie. Uh, question: um, You talked about sort of who applied, and it sounds like you're. I guess, and I know you're subject to the open meeting law, but um, how do you sort of invite the public, you know, or sort of invite applications? Do you do any sort of affirmative outreach to the community or um, what does that look like? We have had before COVID, we have an annual public meeting. Um, we have, the public comes to our meetings often. We have certain people that have come, been coming for years um, and now one of them is on the committee. And, um, you know, I think post COVID we'll probably have another um, real public meeting where we get new ideas. We're supposed to, under the law, we're supposed to do that um, every year. Thank you. So <clears throat> are there other questions for Larissa at this time? So I, I just have one question, Clarissa. Um, you mentioned that, that with, with respect to um, funding churches or religious um, buildings or whatever, that there was mm -hmm. litigation. What was the result of the litigation? The litigation found there was a Washington um, group that brought suit against the church in Acton. And eventually the Acton church was found to be, you know, the, the, the suit was dismissed and, um, but it, it has put a damper on applications from churches to CPA. Um, one of the reasons that this application came from the Covenant Church is one of the leaders of the church is, an, is a preservation architect. He does a lot of work in Boston and he's getting a lot of CPA money from Boston. So that's why he applied to the, his local CPA. Thank you. Any other questions from um, for, for Clarissa? Well, thank you, Clarissa, and and thank you, Alexander, for for the excellent presentation. Um, is there uh, anyone who wants to make a motion on? Remember my uh, admonition earlier that um, we can endorse, we can choose to endorse or choose not to endorse, do nothing uh, with respect to the Community Preservation Act Committee, but the Community Preservation Act itself, or the, the committee's projects themselves go before town meeting with or without uh, finance committee approval. So, Charlie? Yes. It's Dean. I, um, I move that we endorse the um, 2000 fiscal 2023 Community Preservation Act Committee plan as presented currently on the screen with the caveat that there are some clerical numbers that Clarissa described that need to be cleaned up. Thank second. You, Is there a second? Second. Okay. Annie has seconded the motion. Uh, do we have further discussion, questions, or comments? Seeing none, we'll move to a, a vote to, to endorse the um, Community Preservation Act plan for 2023. Um, uh, Grant Gibbion, are you here? No. Shane Blundell? 
Uh, I abstain. Thanks. Um, John Ellis. I will also abstain. Taya Healy. Yes. Brian Beck. Yes. Arif Padaria. Yes. Sophie Magliasso. Abstain. Um, Daryl Harmer. Uh, abstain. Annie LaCourt. Yes. Alan Jones. I abstain because I'm too close to one of the potential recipients, the Historical Society. Uh, George Koser. Yes. Bill Keller. I abstain. Al Tassi. Yes. Wanda Nascimento. Yes. Dean Carmen. Yes. And David McKenna. Yes. Thank you. So um, we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten in the affirmative. And we have one, two, three, four, five, six, six abstentions. So the uh, endorsement has passed. Clarissa and Alexander, thank you very much for your time this evening and for an excellent presentation. Um, and keep up the good work. Thank you. Thank you. And, and thank you for your time. Take care. I'll send that Covenant Church over. Thank Take you. Care. Have a good evening. Good night. Okay. Um, the next um, item on the agenda is uh, the Public Works Department budget. Is that John Ellis? Well, I had, I had been hoping that Christine was going to present, but she's away, so it is going to be John Ellis. Yeah, she's not as, as tough as Arif when Arif was over in, in in Asia, you know, he got up at six in the morning and came to the finance committee meeting. But, uh... Thank you for recognizing that. I appreciate it. <laughs> okay. But just so you know, I am, I am Actually, safe. If she's you look at my background, I'm, I'm not, not a hostage situation. I've just uh, vanished to the basement because my family thinks I'm too loud. So everything's okay. <laughs> All right. <laughs> okay. So you can hold up today's newspaper to prove. It's proof of life. You want to go ahead, John? Sure. So George is going to help me when I make mistakes. Uh, will someone bring up the natural resources budget, which is the first public works budget? That's in, in the uh, manager's budget book, uh, Tara. Page 85. Okay, so I mean, the big picture is that this is level funded, basically. Uh, a few details to draw your attention to are 5211 Rider Energy. This is a new line item because the department is spending on energy costs at Rider, and uh, I think that the Sandy Pooler requested it, or they decided to have a separate breakout for what the energy costs were there. Uh, other details to point out, um, 5289 is tree planting. They, they didn't plant as many as they were planning to in the previous year, but planted more uh, this year. So they're on their plan from the tree management plan. Um, and then there's line 5290, which is a tree pest management. This is mainly to treat em emerald ash borer. 
Um, it turns out that's probably not enough money. So they're uh, thinking about other uh, funds that they could use to, to, to do pest management. Uh, one of the questions that came up when we did the review ahead of time, I think Al Tosti asked about um, reimbursement when gas leaks kill trees. The town has gotten reimbursement for leaks that they were able to demonstrate that the gas was the most likely killer of the tree, specifically the ones uh, in front of the library and town hall. Um, but it's not always easy to prove, you know, why did a particular tree die? Um, but in those cases, they, they did get money from the utilities. Um, then the other detail that's not actually on this budget is that um, there, are, there are two other funds that the town can use for tree planting. One is called the Trees Please Fund. Um, and that's up to, uh, it was in the memo from Mike earlier today, but I think it's around $300,000, maybe 280. Um, and that's a growth of $90,000 over the last year. And that's money from uh, the tree bylaw and uh, tree removal fines and fees. So that's a source of money that they're trying to figure out how to spend. And the second pot of money is money that was uh, in a, a bequest to the town about 10 years ago called the McEachern Estate. It's $150,000. It's in an account that doesn't bear any interest um, and really hasn't been spent. And apparently the department is talking to the tree committee about spending that money on kind of a, a big project. Um, they've been hesitant to spend it because outside contractors um, charge a lot to plant a tree and keep it watered. And the town feels they can do it much more uh, efficiently uh, internally. And then if you scroll down to, uh, to the actual uh, salaries here, so their, um, their tree climber positions are almost never filled. It causes a number of operational problems because um, you need several people to have a, a crew to, to do trimming and other work. So they really can only ever have one crew. And some of their tree staff is, is older and, and um, has been unable to work, has had more injury claims, I guess. So that's a recurring problem. Um, Mike noted that in the past, Minuteman did have kind of a forestry program. They just have a horticultural program now, according to the superintendent who talked at the last meeting, but you'd very much like to have a relationship with um, one of the vocational schools because he feels he could basically guarantee tree climbing jobs to, uh, to recent graduates of, the, of those schools. So those were my notes from that particular um, budget for Street. George, did you have anything, or natural resources, I should say, natural resources. Did you have something to add or other questions? Nope, I think you covered them, thanks. Alan, Alan Jones. Uh, thanks, Mr. Chair. John, uh, roughly how many, uh, what's it cost to plant a tree? How many trees can you plant for $280,000? Do you have any idea? Well, if you hire an outside contractor, they'll charge about, I don't know, thousand, twelve hundred dollars per tree. So if, if the McKeck like two hundred fifty trees or something like that. Well, yeah, the, the McKeck yeah, two hundred two hundred trees. If if you're talking about the yeah. trees, please. But the the expense is the tree itself that the town buys costs about one hundred and twenty five dollars. Um, but then the contractor will charge another you know, two or 300 to put it in the ground. And then to water it every week for two years costs another, you know, five or $600. So it, that's how the numbers get big. But if the town is able to use their staff and now they have two watering trucks and it's already kind of uh, baked in because they they have the staff then the marginal cost can be a lot, a lot less. Um, but if you hire an outside contractor, which is what Cambridge does, it's like a thousand or fifteen hundred dollars per tree. Thank you, Shane. Thanks, John. Uh, the maintenance line item. What is that? 
fund for having staff? I mean, what is is it for contractors, private contractors? Uh, yes, I believe that's that that is that they spend. I know they spend. Uh, so, yeah, they they spend about in two thousand twenty one. They spent about two hundred thousand. I think two thousand twenty two was about three hundred thousand. They they um, you've seen them around town. I forget the contractor, but they because in part they don't have enough tree climbers, and because there's so many trees that need uh, maintenance, either removal or trimming. Um, they have an outside contractor, uh, one that they've used for several years. Um, I can't remember which one it is. And um, they do a lot of tree removal work. And I think they may also have certain kinds of equipment that maybe the town doesn't own for, for bigger trees. So um, yeah, that's, that's that outside contractor for mostly tree work. John, doesn't the DPW pay for half of the field maintenance? That's a different thing later. Okay, thank you. Thanks. Any other questions on natural resources? Uh, do you want to make a, we'll, we'll do all of these DPW budgets in one vote at the end, John and, and George. Okay. Appropriate, that'll save time. Al Tassi. I, I just uh, was curious about the historic sculpture maintenance program. It doesn't look like anything's been spent uh, for 20 and 21. Do they have any future projects to maintain our uh, outside sculpture work? Yeah, so the note from Tara sent it around late this afternoon, but I'll just read what Mike wrote. Um, we used funds to clean and preserve portions of the wall around town Town Hall and the gardens. We plan to continue that work as well as perform preservation treatments to the Uncle Sam statue, Monotomy Indian, and the base of the Town Hall flagpole. So that's that's the work that Mike. Okay, thank you. Okay, let's move on to the next uh, department, sub department. Okay. Ah, so this is this is that uh, the thing you asked about, Kelly, and this okay. is kind of page two of the previous one. Yep. The next department is actually engineering. Okay, might as well move on to the next one, John. Yeah, engineering. Yep. yep. Um. So I I don't really have anything to say about engineering. Um, there there aren't any significant changes to talk about. There, there were no uh, operational issues that came up. It's fully staffed. Um, we didn't really spend any time talking about engineering in our, in our meeting. Sophie? Um, this is just maybe more for, for the new people for benefit. The mobility improvements on 5355, the actuals are a lot lower than the budgeted. What, what is that actually? John, I can, I can Please, perhaps help a little bit. So the mobility uh, improvement this fiscal year was funds in the heights to repair tripping hazards uh, in the brick sidewalks. In fiscal 23, the funds are gonna be spent on improvements to the crosswalks at Chestnut Street um, near Mystic. And um, what's, what you'll see if you look, uh, Julie Wayman put together sort of a better actuals versus what's in the budget book. So in uh, maintenance, which is heavily sorry, in, rather in, in mobility improvements, the actuals in 2021 were $45,000, not 1,000. So there's a fair amount going on in that budget. And again, consistent with what the future looks like. Thank you, George. Any further questions on the engineering budget? Okay, let's move on. 
Okay, so the next one is administration, and this is kind of the only budget that has a change. There's the eighty thousand dollar salary increase, um, and that is the person who I believe used to be part of the IT department, but I didn't check the records. That that was uh, um, Adam Karowski, and so that job, which isn't going to be held by Adam Karowski, uh, is GIS. Um, and other sort of systems work, including a lot of the jobs and you know software development tasks and um, just IT related tasks that are going to help DPW run more efficiently. So um, I don't. To me, it's a it's a moving of, of from one department to the other of the position. Um, but when I looked at the budget book, I didn't see a, a decrease in um, the IT department. So I'm not sure about that, but the job is this IT uh, support for DPW. Mike wrote a little bit of was position will be responsible for leading technology related modernization projects such as better order tracking vehicle maintenance management software and asset management using GIS. So uh, it, it looks to me, John, like that's not a replacement for the uh, GIS uh, systems analyst in the IT department. Uh, is it Arif? Is that you? Or who, who did the IT department, Al? Actually, uh, Bill and I did it. Oh, okay. And I, I don't remember this coming up. Do you, Bill? Bill had to leave early. Oh. I don't remember that. I don't remember the conversation about somebody from IT going. I know that some of the work in the IT expense budget was for GIS, um, but I don't remember any change between here and DPW. Can you go to the, uh, um, you're in a public works. It's 33 is the IT budget if you wanna. You go to page 33. I think you actually wanna to go to page 35. Where the yeah. Okay, maybe the next, the detailed personnel. There we go. So, um, there was no change. Yeah. So, the systems analyst project manager, I think that is, uh, that's open there, is, uh, that was Adam Kar Karowski. Yeah. So, we voted that budget with that position in. Yeah. And the, so that position in the uh, um, DPW uh, is new, it's a new position. Seems to be right. Okay. So any, any other questions uh, on the DPW administration and public works administration? Well, I, would, I was just going to comment that, yeah, Adam Karowski was basically doing two jobs, and I think those have been split up. So the GIS function is going to DPW, and the system analyst function continues in IT. I see. So, so it is a new, overall, a new position. Basically, because Adam is irreplaceable. Right. Any other uh, comments on the DPW and uh, the Public Works Ministry? I mean, there's some part-time increasing in the enforcement of, uh, uh, you know, recycling, and there's some new laws. You can't throw away um, mattresses and stuff. So there's there's some more enforcement um, labor in part-time positions, which doesn't have a direct return on investment. But if the positions didn't exist, there could be a risk of negative impacts with higher uh, disposal costs and, you know, from the uh, trash contracts. Altasti. 
And then I, I don't have a calculator to add up these numbers, but when you look at the budget book numbers for 22, and then you look at the base numbers for 23, they, they just don't make any sense. Um, they look like they should go down, but they're up by about $65,000 because you, you've got the vacant system analyst was at 98 and now it's 77. So there's a $20,000 drop. The rest are pretty identical for a couple thousand. And yet down the bottom, they add up, you know, to uh, that they're increasing. Those, like I said, I haven't added them up, but they just don't make any sense. May I take a shot at that? This is George. Yeah. So in the, in the 2022 budget book, the 98967 is a position that didn't exist in 2022. But because this line came in and there's a, there's a number filled in, so that's really a zero functionally. And in 2023, the new position comes into existence, which gives us the $75,000 um, increase. So that's one of the quirks of how these budgets are presented is, is what was explained. We can check the numbers, but basically the, that position for GIS didn't exist in 2022. Okay. So basically the, the, the base numbers probably add up, but the budget book numbers don't, and there should be a zero. Okay. Yes. Yes, because they trans they probably transferred it from IT because we just had this discussion of whether it was a new position or not. And they they took his budget from IT, his cost from IT and put it there, but mm -hmm. Okay. Um, so I, I, I think uh, the question is whether we think that that additional person is valuable or, or not. Or we, or we should support it or not. Andy Lacourt. Um, well, let me comment on that, which is that I think that position is really valuable because it's going to increase the efficiency of the DPW department. Um, you know, somebody who's worrying about the quality of their systems. And, and only has to worry about the quality of their systems will improve their efficiency. But I also wanted to comment on payback on reducing the waste stream. And I think those positions do pay for themselves because anything that doesn't go into our waste stream, we don't pay for. So any materials that we're diverting elsewhere are, are not costing us money. Thank you, Annie. Um, George or John, do you want to move forward? Sure. Highway. Very little changes on this budget. Well, there is a salary reduction of $46,000. So that goes a long way to offset the other increase. Mm -hmm. Any questions on uh, highways? The, the one thing we talked about operationally was that um, the uh, National Grid and NSTAR have been tearing up a lot of the streets. Um, and the DPW needs to needs and does try to coordinate with them because in certain circumstances, you can get the utility to pay for the full regrading of the street. And in other kinds of situations, you can't. They'll only patch the, the trenches that they dug. And so there's a bit of a dance that happens. No cash exchanges hands generally, but the, the um, you know, some of the street work will be paid for by 
uh, the utility if they tore up the road so bad that it's really unpatchable. And, and this is George, let me add one other thing. Um, should anyone have insomnia tonight and look at Julie Wayman's true actuals versus the actuals in the budget book, you'll see that the other supplies, item 5224 in the 2022-2021 actuals were $610,000 rather than $227,000. The department spent surplus funds uh, that were available on the Arlington Center sidewalk improvements. So all of the costs from that project just went to this one line item in highways. So that was a large project. Um, there were funds in the budget and that's where they all went. Okay, so, but I guess the bottom line here in the highways is, is that it's gone down by uh, from last year's forecast or last year's current, current year's budget, it's forecast to go down by $50,000 in the aggregate. Sophie. Just were there any comments on the, um, the several vacancies in the department on this one? I think there are three or four, four vacancies. We didn't talk about those specifically, but in terms of his, you know, long run concerns about the department recruitment is the um, biggest concern and turnover is the biggest concern. And he, he, would, he would like to think about opportunities to be more flexible um, into how he's able to hire, like, you know, give people Fridays off and, or, you know, Friday afternoons off or, um, you know, other kinds of, um, compensation that's not always cash compensation, but might incentivize people to, to go work in the public sector because it is such a challenge um, to recruit and, and fill the, these, uh, you know, tree climber and highway type positions. Annie, you have your hand. Yeah, I just, I just did a quick glance at the difference between in base pay, and it looks like most of that $45,000 that he's saving on salaries is a result of turnover. That he's reset a whole bunch of positions to a lower budget level because they were turning over. So this is this is George. Can I yeah. respond yeah. partly to that? So um, the director mentioned that they had done a informal comparison of. Mm -hmm. um, pay rates, and that we might be about 10% lower than some of the adjoining towns. So he is going to be looking at that. So he points out that it's his biggest issue is competing with the private sector, which simply pays a lot more for these positions. But in the discussion, it was noted that people don't want to be paying 10% less than adjoining towns if that turns out to be the case, because whether you lose somebody to an adjoining town or to the private sector doesn't really matter. You lost that person. Right. So that's an issue that he will, that the director will be looking at this year. Yeah, then I wish he would not have reset those positions in the budget to their lower range, George. I mean, I know we always encourage departments to do that, but if he's really having trouble hiring, I wouldn't have set them back quite as much as he did. I mean, if you just look at the individual lines, you'll see what I'm talking about. You set them back five, six, seven thousand dollars a year. Andy, yeah, let me remind you that you can't. The finance committee can't ask the. Uh, no, no, I get it. We can't ask them to. I, I'm not saying we should ask them. I'm yeah. just saying that th this is usually a practice we encourage. But if it's yep. causing yep. turnover and allowing us to, and meaning we don't can't compete, then it's counterproductive. Um, we raised the issue and, and the director will uh, will pursue it. Thank you, Annie. Um, any other questions on the uh, highway budget? Okay. Um, should we move on to the next uh, DPW section? Oh, there's this our favorite budget. Are we are we over yet this year? I don't have an answer to that. There were some snow events that weren't. Uh... Yeah, here's your answer. 
Yeah. So there's been some snow since February 14th, including right. tonight, and a few icy nights. But we'll we'll just have to we'll have to catch up on this later later during our sessions. Now, the, as um, in the past, we looked at the, the five and ten year averages on the snow and ice budget. Did anybody see that? Christine looked at that. Um, you have her, George. We're, we're budgeting at about eighty-five percent of the uh, of the running average. Okay. Um. Let's move on. Any, oh, sorry, Andy, you have a question. No, no, just forgot to take my hand down. Sorry. Okay, solid waste. Solid waste. Well, we got a presentation about the new contract. Um, you know, commodities have done better since. Uh, you know, since we had that fear a few years ago that the costs were going to go up by a lot more. So there, there is a 9% increase, but that's a lot better than at, at one point it seemed, seemed, uh, seemed was likely. So I, I don't have anything to add beyond what Sandy presented to us. Uh, one of the first meetings. Altasi, you've been uh, working on uh, reviewing the um, solid waste collection expenses and costs. Do you have any comments that you want to make while we're at this budget? Uh, I, I think when we have some time and I could uh, uh, put our spreadsheet up there uh, and, uh, and maybe review it in more detail, um, I, I think the uh, new contract that we've managed to sign both for collection a couple of years ago and for, well, no, disposal a couple of years ago and collection now have been great. Uh, we, we've avoided some of the things that we feared. And I, I think what my spreadsheet will show is that uh, our diversion or recycling programs are uh, uh, definitely paying for themselves and uh, uh, saving some money. Um, I think with a few more pieces of information which right now I have not been able to get, or we have not been able to get, uh, we could fill that in more, but I can go into more detail when we see the numbers. Okay. And I, so I should have one thing. Annie had asked at this, when we went over the budgets at the beginning, uh, you know, about the questions about pay per throw and what, what was, you know, was that on the agenda? And, and we did talk about that a little bit, the director, you know, is kind of partial to you get one can, but then, then you know, additional uh, cans or additional bags you would be charged for if we were going to do a per charge system. They've also been investigating um, uh, a program that would give everyone the same kind of trash can, and then they could use the the truck that picks up the trash can and dumps it. Um, and they have, you know, side loading ones, and back loading ones. Some are better for not knocking down tree limbs than the others. There's a concern that, you know, some of these things have wheels and Arlington's very hilly. And if you gave everyone trash cans on wheels, the things would fly down, you know, pile up the bottom of Mass Ave. Um, so, you know, there's a lot of discussion of, you know, solid waste and, and opportunities to, to, to improve it. But from a financial standpoint, um, you know, we, we we did well with this contract, as Al mentioned. Okay, let's uh, move on then. Oh, wait, Jane, you have your hand up. Sorry. Sorry, it's okay. It, it, I just so just uh, thanks, Charlie. The solid waste collection, so the nine percent increase, is it going to stay at two point eight, and for how long? Do we know? What's the term of the contract? Oh, this is this is George. Three years is the uh, negotiated term, and it hasn't been signed yet. It's almost signed. There are a couple of details still being worked on. But it would be the two point eight, or you think, or there's a there's a small percentage escalation for Each years year? two and three. 
yeah, for years two and three. Okay, thanks. Sophie? Thanks. Um, I'm not sure if this is the right spot to ask this, but when I saw recycling, it reminded me, someone had told me that when you recycle in town, um, sometimes they collect money or you have to pay something when you go to the recycling center. I'm wondering, do we have any information about how much is collected from the recycling center we run in town? Yeah, that, that the cost of the person who runs that program was in the administration. And yeah, you have to pay for things like uh, TV recycling, um, you know, computer monitor. I, I didn't see a trust fund. Is there a trust fund, George? A lot of that is probably somewhat break even because the town has to, the town sells you the $10 sticker to, 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 for your monitor, but then um, they have to pay somebody else to recycle your monitor. I think the fund balance, the fund balance in the recycling revolving fund is $51,000. So that kind of gives you a, a sense of the scale of what these expenditures and revenues are. Thank you, George. Okay, any further questions on, on the solid waste? Thank you. Jump ahead. Equipment repairs. Yeah, I, I don't have any particular updates. The budget is not changing much. Um, the operational um, the detail that, that was interesting was that um, they've tried but haven't been successful um, and are looking forward to the new building where they think they will be successful um, at having tools that um, when a truck is refilling for gas, um, there are tools that are reading the, um, the check engine system and getting system reports about the trucks. So there's this software that's available and communication protocol that's available for the, for the fleet to communicate with uh, you know, fleet management software. I think that's the kind of thing that will be worked on by this new position, um, but hopefully would make them more efficient at uh, repair because you could get the data that the car or the truck is is spitting out um, every time you refilled. And that was a operational thing I thought was interesting. Questions on motor repair? Oh yes, yeah, Shane. Thanks, Charlie. Uh, so just, there's another, again, a maintenance line item here. So, I mean, we have folks that are doing repairs. Is maintenance or for like the more, like what's the purpose of, I mean, I feel, I feel like the staff are there to do the maintenance and repair, but there's a maintenance line item for 55. Any more detail about what that is? This is George. Um, those, I mean, those 10, those are the expenses. So that's, you know, you tend to replace components. Um, so that's simply the stuff that you buy that, that uh, goes into all the equipment. The director, yeah, the director mentioned, by the way, if you look back four years, those expenses were 63,000, then 33,000, 38, 35. They are declining uh, in part because our fleet is newer now. And the director hopes that both that and the overtime, which is in the salaries part of the budget up above, have been declining. And he hopes they will continue to decline again with a newer fleet that we've had and also with the system that, um, that John mentioned of reading, reading the uh, vehicle's uh, diagnostics every time they come in to be fueled, which will be a partial savings attributable to the new systems analyst position. Um, that is there because without a person there, that system wasn't going to work. Thanks. Sophie. So to follow up on that, if the actual is declining and we expect it to be declining, why, why are we funding it at, at the same higher 55,000 for the maintenance, for example, or the overtime at almost 40,000? Our, the answer was that the building will be done for another year and a half, and it'll take time to get the software and the, and the equipment in. 
So we should look, but so we should note this for like a year or two down the road to make sure we're not just funding at a higher level based on history. I guess. Great. Any other questions on the um, motor and equipment repair budget? Okay, let's move on. Cemetery. Um, cemetery don't have any special updates they're running out of space um but they're hoping to uh make money through other kinds of um burial methods there's sort of an ecological burial um that um, doesn't require as much space and has become more popular. So they may find more space for, for, um, for burials and memorials because of that. Um, the fund went up by over a million dollars. Last year, I asked at the last meeting, the treasurer, how much of that was investment gain and how much of it was uh, sales and I didn't didn't really get an answer to that, but it's a combination of both. Um, I don't have in my notes why maintenance went up thirty thousand dollars. You noticed that George? Um, it actually went down. If, you know if you look at Julie Wayman's true actuals, 2020 was 134 thousand, 2021 was 150 thousand. Again, many of these DPW budgets um, having funds that are uh, that carry over from one fiscal year to the next, which the budget book misses, but Julie's analysis, which she shared with all of us a month or so ago, captures. So there's a lot of questions every year about why are why is the budget higher than the actuals, and this is the first year, and many many thanks to Julie, that we act we have accurate actuals for the DPW. It actually means. Oh. The, the 20 so, uh, George and John why why is the um, why do the offsets increase by thirty thousand dollars when um, I just scanned some of the other budgets and they they don't vary by that much why did why did that jump in cemeteries that's a one-time project uh, to work on the gate to the cemetery so that's a one-time offset to cover one project Okay, thank you. Other questions on cemeteries? Okay, let's move on. Is that it? Street lighting. Oh, street lighting, okay. Well, we're gonna take some time on this one. <laughs> Jane, go ahead, far away. No, no changes. Okay. They're, they're, they're uh, you know, they, they've replaced most of the traffic signals. They're still replacing more. No, no change in the budget. I feel like we missed the water. Something about water, didn't we? No. Different budget, isn't it? It is, but it falls under, uh, I guess it's, well, it's budget. an enterprise fund. Yeah. It's an enterprise fund, but it comes back through the uh, mm -hmm. sets in, to a large degree. So, um, so we don't have a, um, we don't have a, um, a summary page here, right? Uh, John or George? I believe we have to vote each of these individually, although I hope we can just do it as one vote with a motion well, for each. I, I think what we'll do is to, uh, we'll just go down and down the list, starting with the uh, first, ca first category there, um, natural resources, yes. Okay, so um, what I'm going to suggest here is that um, 
you make a motion for voting on um, one million, you know, the, the, the total of one million seven forty six uh, seven sixty uh, for natural resources, and we get a second, and then we move to the next budget, make a motion, and so forth, and then um, just take one roll call vote unless we have an objection from some um, member of the committee. Okay. So uh, if uh, George, if you make the motion and John, you second it, we can get through those all these pages. Okay. I move that we approve the natural resources budget of one million seven hundred and forty six thousand seven hundred and sixty dollars as printed. Is there a second? Second. So I seconded. Okay. So that's been seconded. Let's go to engineering. No, we have to do maintenance of town field separately, I believe. Yeah, but engineering is first, right? Oh, oh no, no, this is still in the um, budget. Okay, so go ahead, George. I move that we approve the uh, maintenance of town fields uh, appropriation of $60,000 as printed. Is there a second? Second. Okay, uh, category is the engineering. I move that we approve the engineering taxation total of $173,728 as printed. Second. Second. Moved and seconded. Uh, next category. I move that we approve the Public Works Administration taxation total of $316,396 as printed. Second. So the moved and second for Public Works Administration. I move that we approve the highway taxation total appropriation of $1,760,041 as printed. Second. Public Administration is removed and is moved and seconded. Snow and ice. I move that we approve the removal of snow and ice appropriation of $1,172,013 as printed. Second. I move that we approve the solid waste total appropriation of $4,272,212 as printed. Second. Move that we approve the highway motor equipment repair taxation total of $445,252 as printed. Second. I move that we approve the cemetery taxation total appropriation of $283,810 as printed. Second. I move that we approve the street lighting total appropriation of $115,000 as printed. Second. I move that we approve the That's traffic it. signals total appropriation oh. of $115,000 as printed. Second. That's all of them. All, all the uh, DPW budgets have been moved and seconded as they're uh, as, and presented as printed. Are there any further points of discussion or questions or any member objecting to voting for all of these categories with one roll call vote. Hearing none, let's move to the vote on the public works budget. Um, Ian? Shane Blundell? Yes. John Ellis? Yes. Makaya Healy? Yes. Brian Beck? Yes. Arif Padaria? Yes. Sophie uh, Migliazzo? Yes. Yes. Um, yes. Shailene Croft? Shailene Croft is not here. Daryl Harmer? Yes. Annie LaCourt? Yes. Alan Jones? Yes. George Koser. Yes. Bill Keller is not here. Um, Al Tosti. Yes. Wanda Nascimento. Yes. 
Christine is not here. Dean Carmen. Yes. And David McKenna. Yes. Thank you. So the vote on the DPW budget is uh, unanimous uh, as presented. Uh, th thank you, uh, John and George, for all this work. That's a huge budget and a lot of issues. Um, if I could make a request, I, I would like the uh, letter from Mike Rodemark, the director, to be added to the minutes as, as an addendum. I would get his permission first, but I thought there was a lot of good information in there that uh, you know wouldn't necessarily be reflected in our minutes, but I think it's useful for the public to know and uh, explains how the department. We, should, we can do that. No problem. Yeah. Okay. I'll, I'll just, I, I just want to make sure he's okay with it. I don't know why he wouldn't be, but I'll tell you tomorrow. Okay. You're going to check with him? Okay. Yeah, let me know. Thank you. So, um, let's see. So, let's go to um, the subject of old business. Um, the first issue is would be uh, Micaiah Healy. You wanted to take us through some changes in the um, personnel and reclass budget? Yes, but um, I just reviewed the numbers and it, it doesn't match. Um, basically what the issue is that Karen Malloy, when we met, um, left out one of the positions from her totals. Um, and that position was the park supervisor. Um, so which was, you know, the addition is in the amount of 2,769, but um, I, need to, I, I need to check with her numbers again. Okay. Um, Let's, we'll we'll just uh, postpone it till, till, till Monday. Thanks. Uh, was there any other old business? Something's in the back of my mind here that we wanted to, oh, uh, Daryl, you had some, uh, you brought back some questions on the, uh, you answered some questions that we raised on the police budget. Did you want to make any comments about that or that those emails stand by themselves? Uh, I, I think they stand by themselves unless um, okay. anyone yeah. has any further questions. Thank you, Daryl. Any, any other questions on those? No. Okay. So um, are there any other open items that anybody wanted to bring up? Yes, Sophie. Uh, so I'm going to try and remember what my question was. Um, I said to you, Charlie, and I think it was regarding um, software costs and how they're done through the departments, because I was noticing on the meeting we had Monday, the capital planning for the school, it seems like the school software costs are being put through capital planning, but I know in the budgets I reviewed, software is taken on by the individual department. So I don't know across all the departments if that's the same or not? Well, I can say that um, I'm, I'm not sure which software you're referring to, but um, the general accounting software in Munisystem is in the budget of the um, IT department. And there are some, um, I can't think of the terms of art, but there are some school management software programs not, not apart from academic, but software management programs, which I believe are carried in the school budget, right, Dean? Yes. Um, did you remember the name of the so, power school, school is the big one. Power, that's the one, yeah. Power yep. school. Okay. Charlie, I think we're in, in a transitional period where we're going from paying a big chunk of software, you know, big chunk of money to buy a piece of software, which would be at a capital expense versus subscription software, which becomes an operating expense. So I think, you know, you'll see yeah. expensive purchase software in a capital budget and subscription software in the expenses. It'll head that way for everything. Yeah. Yeah, I don't think we capitalize maintenance contracts or ongoing subscriptions. We just capitalize the implementation projects and initial purchase. Okay, but I, 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 think, you, I think you're right in principle, Annie. Right. But maybe uh, Al, you and Bill could just um, clarify that with the um, new uh, IT department head. Just generally advise us on what, because I, I think there are maintenance, software maintenance and software li licensing costs in the IT department in addition to what may show up in other departments. 
Well, so, I, I think some departments have a have a software that applies to only to their department, uh, and and is not a general based software that other everybody uses. So if it's just general based software, I, I think it's in IT. But if it's just for the only people using it as one department, like say the assessors in their revaluation through mm -hmm. Patriot, you know, they have it in their budget. So I, I, I think it varies that way. Yes. That sounds <laughs> rational. You agree with that, Annie? Yeah, police has got a special application. Fire department's got a special application. I think planning and community development has always carried the GIS software. Um, assessors got a package, it, and it they're usually sort of very specific single use um, pieces of software that only apply to a particular department, and they all come with maintenance costs and upgrade costs. Okay. So do we think the, in the capital plan under IT, when it has, it says school and software licensing, that's because it's part of a larger project? It'll... I believe so, yeah. I mean, the capital plan folks are pretty good about not capitalizing something that's not capital. Well, we'll see about that. That's the discussion. <laughs> <laughs> Really? You think they're trying to pull one over on you, Charlie? I'm, I'm yeah. sorry, I missed it on uh, we had a, You weren't here last week, well, last meeting. Yeah, I was busy we... trying to destroy the entire town of Arlington at the ARB, so. Okay, so um, in any event, the uh, there is a discussion about what they are trying to call capital, et cetera. It's a little late to get into it tonight, but maybe uh, Wanda or someone else can give you the background. Um, okay, anything else to bring up this evening? Charlie, did you want to go over the uh, treasurer's budget? I'm sure we could do it pretty quick. Uh, yes, that would be great. Let's do it. Uh, okay, can um, Tara, can you pull up the treasurer's budget? I believe it's on page 42. Um, like everything else, um, tonight, the uh, reduction is due to turnover in the treasurer's office. There's a number of uh, uh, new openings, and so the actual uh, amount of salaries has dropped. Um, the deputy tax collector uh, used to get paid. A, this is um, a, a set fee. This has now been turned over to a vendor who actually takes a portion of the fees when they collect it. So that, that is gone. Um, everything else is the same. The only thing is you're just having the discussion about software. The data processing expenses is the invoice cloud, which is the online payments software. Um, the general reimbursement is basically for mileage and parking to the staff. They expect the travel to start beginning again this year. And, and they're, so they're uh, gonna have in-state and a little bit of out-of-state travel next year. Um, aside from that, um, this thing is, is flat, actually it's reduced. So um, I would move that we would accept the $703,320 as the um, total for the treasurer collector budget. Second. So it's been moved and seconded. Are there any questions? John Ellis. I, I don't see postage. I thought postage was usually in this budget. No, there's a postage is a separate budget, which we'll do next. So, um, the other questions? Do you want to do the, uh, um, Charlie, you want to do the postage and the parking listen, and vote them all together? Um, well, no, let's just, uh, let's just do this one and we'll go okay. next because they were they're pretty disparate the, all the the public works budgets were really under one department okay so um are there any other questions okay seeing none let's vote this um, treasurer's budget by the way uh just as a comment i i hope um I'll, at some point we need to have a discussion as to whether or not what the, what the staffing level is in the treasurer's department. 
we, we actually had that discussion. If you want, we can have it a little bit later when we have more time. <laughs> okay, good. Um, so it's been moved and seconded for the uh, uh, treasurer's budget. What was the amount? It was uh, seven seven hundred three thousand three hundred twenty dollars. Yes. John Ellis. Yes. Makaya Healy. Yes. Brian Beck. Yes. Arifa Daria. Yes. Sophie Migliazzo. Yes. Daryl Harmer. Yes. Annual Court. Yes. Alan Jones. Yes. George Koser. Yes. Al Tosti. Yes. Wanda Nascimento. Yes. Dean Carmen. Yes. David McKenna. Yes. Unanimous vote as uh, presented. So, um, postage. Okay. Um, the only change here is a reclassification for in state travel to auto allowance of the 2626. Um, I, we did uh, speak to the treasurer and I said, uh, asked about the increase in the postage rates and she said that the postage should be adequate. Um, one last thing again, the data processing, data processing is the actual Pitney Bowes machine. So I, would move, I would move the um, $185,869 for the postage. Second. So it's moved and seconded, John Ellis. Um, I'll just say what I said last year, which is I've been a Arlington taxpayer since 1999. I've gotten four tax bills a year. Uh, I'm sorry, I can barely hear you. For the last 20 years, I've thrown out every tax bill that's been mailed to me because my bank pays my taxes. When can we expect to see reductions in the postage for sending bills that nobody really needs to get? Um, they're moving to the new system, and supposedly that's when you people can opt out. But they can't do that for water bills yet. They can only they apparently they can do it for um, real estate. And I'm not sure about excise. Yeah, I, I, I after this conversation last year, I was able to get my bill emailed to me and save the town. Right, but you have to go online and and actually request it. Yeah, it's a real real. Pain so I think you need to educate the, um, uh, the the people in town about that, and then if you want, then we'll have to spend for the advertising if you think that people are going to do it. But I think from what I heard from the treasurer's office is that they have a large following of people that like to come in <laughs> for whatever reason. Okay. Hey, um, thank you, John. Are there any other questions uh, on the uh, postage budget? Okay, hearing none, we'll go move to a vote. Shane Blundell? Yes. John Ellis? Yes. Kaya Healy? Yes. Brian Beck? Yes. Arif Fedaria? Arif Fedaria? Maybe we lost the ring. Sophie? I, I, yes. I, I, yes. Um, Charles, uh, Shay, Shaylene's not here. Uh, Daryl Harmer? Yes. Uh, and, Annie LaCourt? Yes. Alan Jones? Yes. George Koser? Yes. Al Tosti? Yes. Wanda Nascimento? Yes. Dean Carmen. Yes. David McKenna. Yes. So um, is Arif here? Arif Adaria? Y yes, yes, yes. Okay. The, uh, the postage budget is passed uh, unanimously for, um, what is that? 185,869. Thank you.
Okay, we're at the magic hour. Uh, we've got a lot done tonight. Thank you very much uh, for all your time, especially uh, John and uh, George. Great job on the DPW budget. And uh, I guess, uh, Brian, are you doing parking? I have it if you want to do it now. Or we can nope. save it for the next time. We'll save it for the next time. Thank okay. you. The motion to adjourn is in order. So moved. So moved. So moved. Second. Second. <laughs> moved and seconded. Hearing no opposition, we're adjourned. Thank you very much.